Welcome to the Radical Lifestyle Podcast, brought to you by Generation to Generation, where you will be inspired by the past, equipped for the present, and prepared for the future, as we engage in conversations with people from around the world. Hello everyone, this is Andrew and Daphne from Generation to Generation, and our guest today is Tisha Michelle. Tisha, for people that don't know who you are, can you just say a bit about where you're from and what you do? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, my again. My name is Tisha Michelle, and I am. I originally, I, I'm originally from California, but I've been living in Israel for uh, since 1993. I'm a tour guide. I have a travel company and uh, a nonprofit in Israel, and um, I've been doing this all the way. My mom started Christian tourism back in 1968. And um, she took her first trip to Israel and fell in love with the country. And so I've, I've been walking in her footsteps and I've been on tour in Israel since 1968 when I was just nine months old. Wow. Um, and then for people who listen to this that want to find out maybe more about you, maybe mm -hmm. even use you for the tours or whatever, uh, we'll see how time, <laughs> what happens in the next right. few years and months. But um, where can they do that? Um, you could just look up tishamichelle.com. Okay. And Perfect. that's the best way. Yeah, that's the best way to see what we're doing. Uh, also, we have our nonprofit is Impacting Israel. Okay. And I will put the links to those in the description so that they're okay. ready for people to go and check out. Um, now, you just said uh, very briefly, uh, your mum started tour tourism in Israel, Christian tourism in Israel. Uh, right. But people may hear that and think what you mean is she herself started doing it. But that actually you mean a lot more than that. She was a part of the foundations of actually starting the whole of Christian tourism in Israel. Right. So can you just talk a bit about that? Because people may hear that and think, oh, she herself started doing it. Right. Um, well, my mom's mom, uh, her name was Polly Grimes. And she started pioneering tourism uh, in 1968, but she is on the gospel. She was in the gospel music hall of fame. She pioneered gospel music in the Western United States. And she was producing big concerts like uh, Bill Gaither and filling coliseums. And someone came to her in 68 and said, Hey, listen, you're filling these coliseums with thousands of people. Have you ever thought about taking a trip to Israel? And what happened is she said, she said that, that, during her high school valedictorian speech, she talked about Israel was a fulfillment of prophecy and how Israel um, and, and, and is, Israel had once again, Jerusalem had been reunited in the 67 war. And she said she would love to take a tour to Israel. And she took her first tour to Israel. There was no one around. There were no tourists. And she fell in love with the land. And she just believed that every Christian has to come to Israel because it will change their lives. Walking where Jesus walked, uh, the sight, you know, the sight seeing where the miracles took place, where the prophets walked, it's life changing. I mean, the Bible becomes technicolor. It's no longer black and white. So she went back to the Israel government tourist office and the Israeli government and told them, uh, that she wanted to help them start a Christian tourist market. And they had no idea there was a Christian tour. Why would, why would Christians want to come to Israel? And she literally helped them start a Christian tourist market. And so for Israel's 50th anniversary, she was awarded one of the, one of the 10 awards from the state of Israel for her contribution to the state. Wow. But <laughs> how did she... How did she gain momentum? Because very often people have an idea and they do something, they'll take a trip out there. But there's there's a whole journey that goes from I'm taking a group now to the momentum that was built that, I mean, impacts us personally today. It probably impacts Christians from all over the world and not just Christians who come. Um, that is quite a journey. Can you get, take us on a bit of that? Well, she was a pioneer. She literally was a pioneer. She, I mean, she went to unchartered territory. I mean, even with the gospel music, it was something that was unheard of in the Western United States. But, you know, she helped a lot of these old gospel and country, country stars, I mean, get to where they are. I think when Bill Gaither 
when she saw Bill Gates for the first time, I think they had like 18 people in their show and my and the concert. And my mom said, no, no, this is, you know, because I mean, I mean, obviously she was, she loved the Lord and, you know, she knew the Bible more than, than anyone I know. And she was a scholar, but, but I think that the Lord just directed her to, to, you know, to, to go into these unchartered territories. The same thing with Israel. She was led there. She believed, I mean, she, she already, when she was 18 years old, she already knew that Israel being reborn, that was, that, sorry, that was fulfillment of prophecy. And, and that was, and, and, and so that, those are the things that just, that, that, that were her driving force was her belief. And, and, um, and I mean, Israel changed her life. She actually, after, after she came to Israel, I, her, her, everything shifted. So you grew up a child of this woman. Yes. How, I mean, I'm not going to ask how that impacted you because obviously her DNA became your DNA. But when you look back, what do you think as, as you thought growing up with your mother, this pioneer and, and seeing things happen and you living with this person as your mother? You know, it's, um, I'm a lot like my mother, but when, you know, I mean, I grew up backstage with all these gospel singers and, and, and all these concerts, but I also grew up on a bus in Israel and just, you know, it's just walking in her footsteps. It was, uh, it was life changing. I mean, she taught us so much, but the most important thing my mom taught us was was our faith, and you know our faith and um, and and Yeshua Jesus and um, and uh, so she she really was an amazing an amazing person, but everything everything that she believed in was really really impacting. To, uh, it was impacting to us. And um, I mean, that was her for foremost, foremost thing is that, you know, that you have to listen to the Lord, serve the Lord, dig into the scripture, and everything else will come together. Mm -hmm. so, often when children grow up with their parents having a passion, a mission, a profession, or, or whatever it is, they decide, no, not for me, I'm going in an opposite direction. This, this is not, not going to happen. <laughs> But you made a different decision from that. You have right. continued. What in? Why did you decide? I mean, apart from the statement, I felt it was what the Lord wanted me to do. Apart from that, right. what? Why have you continued that? You know, uh, you know. Obviously, when we go through our, you know, our youth and everything, you know, obviously that wasn't a given. But for me, in particular, I used to weep. And I couldn't even explain it when I was when I was just a kid. I probably like five, six years old. When I would leave Israel, I would weep. And I could. I, how do you explain that? But now I know it's the Lord's land. It's the Lord's people. Um, scripture tells us we're to comfort His people. That they're the apple of His eye. And and so the Lord just placed that the ministry that my mom was doing, the Lord placed it on my heart as just a little child. So it was never something, it was something that I always knew. I guess I, I feel very, very blessed that it, was, it started as a child. And I always knew that that would be my destiny, is the ministry in Israel. But you couldn't just tip into it, because from what I know about being a tour guide and being in that position... It isn't easy, and you can't just suddenly decide, you know, I know a lot. I think I'm going to go and do this. <laughs> what did it take for you, and what does it take for tour guides in general to be able to do this? Because yeah, someone told me, right. um, uh, I'm guessing this is true, that tour guides in Israel, are, for people that, that don't know, are, are as respected as lawyers um, at for the extent of the training and everything that they have to go through. Like this isn't just, oh, you're a tour guide, you get to just go around and talk about it. like there's <laughs> extensive training, things that you have to go to to be able to qualify to do this. So what was that right. training? What what happened? 
So it's uh, we're actually navigational teachers for the you know licensed by the state of Israel. And I always knew I wanted to do it. I mean, even as a child, I would run behind the tour guide and I was fascinated. I always wanted to do it, but you're right. It's a very difficult course. It's a two-year course. And <clears throat> I think we climbed almost every mountain in the country. We studied courses like geomorphology, geology, plant biology, wars, history, archaeology, and all in Hebrew. So it was very hard. I mean, I can't, those, those classes in English are hard for me, but to study them in Hebrew. And the funny thing is, is I had this girlfriend from Belgium and we kind of stuck together and studied together, but they would like the Israelis in the course would laugh at us because there were certain things that we didn't know. I mean, we weren't born in Israel and <clears throat> they would kind of laugh at us. And in the end, we, it, it, it forced us to, to study so hard that in the end they were coming to us because we were at the top of the class. <laughs> but but um, it's, it's a very, very difficult course. Once you're done with the course, it's not a given that you will actually, you know, get, uh, get your license. You, uh, for us, we had to go before a board of 10 professors wow. and they could wow. question us on anything they wanted that had to do with Israel. And uh, not just that, we had to be prepared for 10 different subjects, an hour lecture on each subject. And they could just ask us, okay, go and do this. <laughs> and then obviously a written test. It was very hard. I think 95% of our course failed the first time. Wow. Well, uh, my brain yeah. has already gone into dead mode. Right. Because, it, it's and, difficult. And, it, you, and the people who are lecturing you, they aren't necessarily, they aren't messianic. I mean, you're, you're learning this from... All different religions, are you not? Don't you have to learn how to do this to any group? Oh yeah, we. <clears throat> I mean, some of this. I mean, some of this. Uh, Judaism was one of the subjects. Islam was one of the subjects. I mean, yeah. No, you have to learn. Yeah, to, uh, actually, for for you know all the religions, you know that would be relevant in in tourism in Israel. But Did you reach. Uh, oh, sorry, go on. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, did you reach any point where you thought, forget this, this is just not worth it? <laughs> um, it was, I mean, it was hard, but I think what, you know, what drove me to, to, to continue is that I knew, I mean, I knew that was my destiny and I knew that's what I wanted to do, but it was really difficult. I think when, when uh, I had my lecture, obviously other people chose Christianity and that was the one that they really wanted to do. They were hoping they would get Christianity. Obviously, in my in my test, I wanted Christianity, but I got the Golan Heights. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the professor asked me, "Okay, what 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 lecture did you get?" And I said, "The Golan Heights." He said, "So, what are you going to lecture on?" I said, "Christianity and the Golan Heights." <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> they call it chutzpah, you know. I was. <laughs> yeah. You could have done anything in Israel with exactly. that, couldn't you? I exactly mean, right. Because so. <laughs> it is what it is. Would the um, when they uh, question you about the subject, would it purely be from a historical standpoint, or would you have to answer questions about modern day situation, for example, in the Golan Heights? They can ask any. <clears throat> so when they so you do your lecture. And they they stop you, and then they have the liberty to ask all the ten, all ten of them um, any question pertaining to Israel. It can be anything, not just history. It can be anything, and you have to know the answers. And the the difficult thing is they try to trick you. Are you sure? Yes. Are you sure? You're sure? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How committed is she to this answer? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm glad I finished that. <laughs> It is crazy. I know that um, for for a project we were doing, um, just for one session, we had a guide who was an Orthodox Jew, right? And he knew he was talking to Christians, right? Mm -hmm. We had to have him for one particular session of a documentary we made. And he knew he was talking to Christians. And I found it really interesting listening to him being a tour guide to Christians and translating it as he thought we wanted, we needed to hear it. 
Oh, but that yeah. must, <laughs> yeah. So have you ever had groups that aren't Christians and you too have had to tailor what you're saying um, sure. into a realm that you're not used to? How do you do that? You just learn. I mean, I, when you take the course, they don't actually teach you what to say. So everything, you know, you know, at times and, and how to set up, the, you know, the, the, the actual tours, but they don't teach you what to say. You have to take all the history and all the information and you have to put it together yourself into what works for you. And, you know, and that's hard, but it's trial and error. So you start with you start with something and then, you know, you and in and, and life, just like life, you're constantly growing, you're constantly learning. And so you add things and. But when you, even if, if, if I'm just guiding Christian groups, there's different Christians, you know, there's messianic mm -hmm. and there's different. So you have to even not just cater to a non-believing group. You have to cater to the different types of Christians that you're, that, that are coming on to her. Um, and then I've also done a lot of, of political things, um, you know, uh, like political tours and, uh, and also, you know, uh, entertainers and things like that that have come to Israel. So obviously you're going to have to alter, you know, alter um, your delivery and, and uh, for every single tour. Mm. Uh, how on average, <laughs> how long does it take you to prepare for a tour? Um, f I mean, just for what I'm going to say. Yeah. It's, it's all here. I don't have to prepare. Oh, have to. No. Uh, yeah. Okay. I guess you've yeah, been doing not, it for so long. Not anymore. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think we had this teacher and he was like, he was a commander. I mean, he was a commander in the army and uh, he, the one, one thing he said is don't ever let anyone see you reading anything. So that stuck with us. And so, you know, you have to get all the information in your mind and not read anything. And so, yeah, it's all here. Of course that allows that it. That <laughs> I would say something else that you have that could be lacking is you have the passion to go with what's here. And and that passion is what is catching. I mean, we have been on a couple of your tours and it's the passion that we pick up. Without passion, it, it just kind of lands in the head and, and that comes across now. And I, I would say if I had to have one moment that encapsulated you and we've we've been coming to israel 15 years something i don't know how long but there's one moment that encapsulates you in that is when you stand on masada and the bird flies onto your hand <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry it's nothing anymore like it's not standing on the Mount of Olives and right. all of that. But yeah. when you, that that was something that it's not doesn't mean that's what I learnt most from you. But it's no, like, oh, right, right, right. <laughs> when you, well, feed the birds, you know, Mary Poppins. So no, people not need exactly. <laughs> but I've never. It just is. So, Tisha, we've talked about the land of Israel and where Jesus walked, where the prophets walked, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What about Israel today and Israel tomorrow? Is there any relevance in Israel? Because you know many people go for yesterday, but there's a whole unfolding today and tomorrow isn't there from that land. Oh yes, I mean, I mean, <laughs> Scripture is coming alive, and and obviously, obviously, I mean. In 1948, when David Ben Gurion made the Declaration of Independence and a nation was born, that's, I mean, those are messianic signs. There's messianic signs all around us. And a nation was born 2,000 years later. Where do you ever see a nation born 2,000 years later in fulfillment of prophecy? I mean, Ezekiel's dry bones come back to life and a nation is born. Uh, just looking around, there's so many, you know, there's messianic signs, uh, even a language, a Hebrew language. It was reborn 2,000 years later. I mean, no one spoke Hebrew. It was rebirthed in the, you know, uh, when, uh, when El, uh, Eliezer ben Yehuda revived the Hebrew language, made the first modern Hebrew dictionary, a nation, an ancient, an ancient language came back to life. I mean, there's so many messianic signs. So, 
we can just see that, that, that scripture is being fulfilled right before our eyes. Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a city that was separated. East Jerusalem was under Jordan between 48 and 67. And then the 1967, Jerusalem was a city that was reunited. Again, fulfillment of prophecy, scripture says. Jerusalem, a city compact together. And so, you know, that's when our paratroopers burst through Lion's Gate and for the first time ever wept at the Western Wall. Just an amazing, an amazing moment. Probably one of the most amazing moments in Israeli history. So scripture, even, you know, it's being fulfilled before our eyes and definitely Israel is relevant today. Yeah, mm. I think some, oh, this is, you, you may disagree with this, but I think sometimes when groups come, they're so focused on the past, they forget about today and tomorrow. One of our statements is, um, we say, Israel, Israel is a nation where you stand in the past, present and future in one moment in time. Right. And yeah. to hold right. that. So does Israel have a future? I mean, is there a future sure. in Messiah with Israel? Absolutely. Absolutely. Talk to us about we know, it. Well, we know that Messiah is going to come right through the right through the eastern gate. And um we know that Israel has a future. And um, you know, uh that's, you know, scripture says of the Mount of Olives, that's where his feet are going to touch. That's where he, Mount of Olives, right there in Jerusalem, the holy city. I mean, that's where, that's where Messiah entered the city. He wept over the city and he ascended to heaven and it's where he's going to come back. So absolutely, Israel has a future. Have you got, um, oh, I mean, this is probably an impossible question to answer, but I was going <laughs> to say, have you got a, a favorite place that you love to go in the land or is just like forget it just the whole thing <laughs> <laughs> well obviously like you said the, the passion i mean israel is in my heart and yes i do have passion i couldn't i'm not an actress and um i you know if, I, I always say if i don't get more excited than you do when i'm guiding you then we're in trouble because mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. otherwise you just, it, it turns into just the facts ma'am and that's i don't ever want to be there Hmm. Um, so yes, there's so many places in the country that I, I love, but probably my, my favorite, favorite sites are the Man of Beatitudes and the Galilee in general. That's where I live. And, uh, and then also I love Masada as well. Hmm. I know that they're, they're constantly uncovering new sites, new things have been discovered. Um, are there... I just wanted to ask her why before oh, you move okay, on. okay, sorry, carry on. <laughs> why are those your favorite? <laughs> why are they my favorite? Yes. Uh, well, the, the, the whole Galilee area, I mean, that's the center of his ministry. Mm. And the Mount of Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and you just know Jesus spent, there's a, that tiny little era, area on the northern side of the Sea of Galilee mm. saw three quarters of the gospel. Mm. And so very, very special place. Um, so I love, I love the Galilee and then Masada because of its significance in modern Israel. I mean, Masada fell. Masada was the last stand in the land. When Masada fell in 73 AD, it looked like it was all over. And if it wasn't for a miracle from God, we wouldn't be back in our land. And just, you know, just, just a, a, a note that, that, literally where the synagogue is in Masada, we had already come back to the land. Prophecy had already been fulfilled. And that's where we found the oldest scripture of Ezekiel 37, prophesying that a nation would be reborn. And it was already a done deal. So Masada is very impacting. To, you and know, and to I me. think you told us about the snails that were found. Right. So that's uh, the Can snails. Can you tell that they, one? Yeah, sure. Yeah, that is in Caesarea. So Caesarea by the sea, beautiful on the Mediterranean Sea, that is where the murex snail used to wash up on the shore. And now in biblical times, they extracted, the Romans uh, actually and the Jews actually extracted the dye from the murex snail, which was this beautiful blue colored dye that was used for the tallit. Um, in, the, in the fringes, there was one blue fringe. Uh, one blue thread, and um, also they used it for the high priest garments, and it was a very big commodity during the Roman period. But 
they say that in uh, when with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, that snail stopped washing up on the shores of Caesarea. I just disappeared. And we know that scientists started watching as this snail started coming back up on the shores after 1948, after the nation was rebirthed in fulfillment of prophecy, that snail started washing back up on the shores of Caesarea. And, you know, they, they did everything they could to get this, this dye out of the snail, but nothing worked. And eventually one of the scientists got frustrated and he took this, this cup with the snails and put it on the windowsill. And the sunlight hit it, and that dye came out. You see, we just need the sun. Wow, that is amazing. Of course, with Galilee, one of the things that I love is looking out. You actually can look at it and say, this is what Jesus saw. Yep. What the disciples saw. You know, other places where there's new buildings or the excavations underground and all the rest of it. And I'm not minimizing that, but uh, you just never tire, I don't think, of being right. out there on, on the Galilee and going, we are really seeing what he saw. So I interrupted you. Over no, to you. it's right. For people not watching it on YouTube, I, I can see at the corner of my eye, my mum will look at me, my co-host. So I know she, oh, she wants to say something. She wants to interject. Um, yeah, so are there any... Um, excavations going on are there any things which are being discovered right now that you've heard about that really excite you about the possibilities of what could be there um so i just i i've just come back from israel and i was able to interview ellie shukran who is excavating who, who who found the pool of siloam in the city of david he also found something very significant which um, has to do with a, a special perfume that was made. We know that the people of Engedi made this perfume, and he uncovered something that showed us about this perfume. Uh, he also uncovered a couple of years ago something that looks like it might be the altar of Melchizedek, which is very interesting, and he took us through, and it's not open to the, the general public, but just fascinating um, I also was able to interview a, a professor called Professor uh, Mordechai Aviam. This is his fifth year excavating a location right there in the northern shores of the Sea of Galilee, which he believes to be the accurate Bethsaida where Jesus healed the blind man. So there's, you know, I always say it's like the world went to sleep, but we're still excavating and finding amazing things even to, you know, even today. Wow. Amazing. And, and this wasn't immediate. It was a few years ago it started, but they've also, from the city of David, the actual pilgrim's path has been uncovered leading up to the Temple Mount. I got that right? Yep. Yes. Ellie found, Ellie found that too. Yeah. And we were, we, were, we were there the other day, and uh, it's just fascinating. That's why I say you know there's places like that, and it leads from the Pool of Siloam where the Feast of Libation yeah. was. And where Jesus also healed the blind man. And it leads all the way up to the Holy Temple. So you know Jesus would have walked on that path many, many times. Is that open to the public yet? Yes. It is. Yeah, now. you can actually walk underground from the Pool of Siloam all the way up to the Western Wall. Now, one of the things that I think is, is our passion in people coming, not only is it totally transformational, I mean, people talk about experiential learning and don't really know what it looks like. Well, if they come on a tour with you, you get experiential learning, right. which is a total um, absorption of what's happening. But one of the things that we really, really want people to leave, not just knowing this all was or this is, but what is to come. And I don't think... There is anywhere that you can really leave going, he is returning. I've seen the place. I know where his feet is. And I've seen prophecy fulfilled today. So I know he's coming back. And um, one of the, we take multi-generational groups. So we always have um, children, young people. And I love to take them to the Mount Zion Hotel. And I tell them to look out. And I take their picture and I say to them, you may forget everything else. 
you may but look out this window and I point out the Mount of Olives and the city of Davies down there, etc. There's Mount Zion where his presence will dwell forever. And I say to him, I want you to remember this, if nothing else, you are looking at your future. And, and we take a picture of the, that window. But if, to us, if people don't leave knowing, hey, he's coming back, we feel We've missed it and something that will make you laugh that we do. When we're on uh, Hus Promenade, Hus Promenade right? yeah. and, and everybody's looking at over Jerusalem, we say to them, look at the sky, what do you see? And they're nothing because it's just all blue. A few clouds. And they, well, if there <laughs> maybe. are any, maybe. <laughs> and then we, they say, what? And we say, look, you're not seeing. And they're looking up again. We say, you are just not seeing what's up there and then eventually we say this is the most significant sky anywhere in the world this is where the new jerusalem is coming down and the funny thing is tisha they take their cameras out and start start taking pictures of the sky but to me it's a story half told if they don't leave knowing what's coming he's coming absolutely back. Absolutely. What would you say about that? Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, it's just that's like that. That's obviously one of the most. That is the most important thing that they need to know in going to Israel. But like you said, I mean, from just from that location, that the scripture says that the Lord abides in Zion. It says it's that's his resting place forever. That sounds like a long time. <laughs> and, you know, when you're up on that mountain <clears throat> or the Haas Promenade or even Mount Zion, you can see those three mm. valleys. Mm. And those three valleys of Jerusalem, one is the Kidron Valley where God's going to judge the nations on account of how they've treated Israel. So that's where judgment's going to be. The other valley is called the Cheesemakers Valley or the Tyropian Valley. And then you've got uh, the third valley, which is just under Mount Zion, which is the Valley of Gehenna. Mm -hmm. Now, those three valleys form this. And that, if you know Hebrew, is the Hebrew letter Shin. And you might see on every mezuzah and every prayer box and every door, you will see Shin. And that stands for Shaddai, God Almighty. Now, not just did the Lord write in scripture that he has implanted his name on Jerusalem. Literally, you can see from an aerial view, those three valleys form the Hebrew letter Sheen, and they enwrap Zion where the Lord, abi uh, where the Lord abides. And so it's just amazing. I mean, he's even implanted his name on Jerusalem. That's that's how significant it is to him. You know, there may be people listening as we come to a close. Um, then, are you want to say something? I'll see, I'm getting that. that look again. I'll I can see it at the corner of my eyes. Go on. <laughs> no, no. Go on. Well, I, I can end with mine. I, well, I I wanted to. I didn't want to close without addressing the issue of anti-Semitism rising across the earth because while we're enthusing and come to Israel and all of this I don't want to ignore the darkness that is rising over the earth as far as anti-semitism um, that is affecting every nation and most people will meet it at some point how how has this affected you and and how has it affected people you know I mean, thank God I, it hasn't affected us. Mm. Um, but I, I know that, that hate crimes for Jewish people all over the world are, are on a rise. And it's, it's, absolutely, devast it's absolutely devastating. But, um, I mean, thank God, you know, we don't see that living in Israel. Mm. We, don't see, we don't see a lot of anti-Semitism. But worldwide, it's on a rise and we just need to, you know, pray because um it's it's devastating very sad why do you think anti-semitism is rising i think spirit i think it's a spiritual thing actually yeah yeah, yeah. 
definitely. Sometimes people say, um, "Oh, you they know, don't even know why they hate." <laughs> yeah, well, we do. Yeah. yeah, but sometimes people take a step back and they say, "Oh, we're not getting involved," or um, there was just a vote in the UN, I think, last week about um, Jerusalem, and America and the UK abstained, and. And from our perspective, there is no abstaining, because mm -mm. abstaining means always means you side with the abuser, one hundred percent of the time, and um, and I think people listening that you may be able to go to Israel, you, you may be able to go. We don't. Nobody knows what what's happening or when, but we all have a part to play wherever we are in this planet of standing up, speaking up, and of. Um, working with Yeshua for the protection of the apple of his eye. And so yeah. I just wanted to bring that up to date. But I, I hope people listening, I, I hope I hope personally Israel's going to open up. I hope you will be fully booked again with tours. And I know um, many, many people come, and I know your tours are quite big. But, um, mm. you know, I encourage people to get in touch with you if they want to know more. Or further down the line, if they'd like to know something about us. <laughs> but um, I'm very, very grateful. I'm grateful for the way, Tisha, you, you impacted our lives and while well, we were there yeah. and, and the lives of many, many people and the eternal weight of glory. And we're, we're called generation to generation, and you've surely lived that out with your oh, mother. Mm. That's right. Yeah, for people listening who uh, are thinking about going, uh, maybe they've been on the fence or they're like, oh, you know, uh, maybe I should. Uh, as, a, as a parting message, uh, what would you say to those people? Why should they go to Israel? Uh, maybe what have you seen it do to other people's lives after they've gone and been exposed to the land and, and the history, but also the future of it? I, I just, I, I, I cannot stress more that a trip to Israel is life changing. Again, just to see where Jesus walked, where everything took place, the miracles took place, where the prophets walked, it's life-changing. It will bring the Bible to life, and it really will, and um, it will change your life. It will no longer be black and white. It'll be no, alive. It'll be 3D. That's right. Or, or more. That's right. <laughs> yeah. The Bible will be... Th it's nothing like reading the Bible and going, yep, I know where that is. Yep. Yeah. I know it, th there's nothing like it. It's, no. It's, yeah. It isn't. Tisha, thank you so much for taking the time. Really appreciate You're it. Welcome. It's good to catch up thank with you, you, number one. But yeah, thank you so much. And for people listening again, websites are in the description. Go check out what she's doing. Um, and thank you. Thank you again. And we'll look forward to next time. God bless. Hope to see you soon. Okay. <laughs> Bye, Tisha. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode. If it inspired you, please rate us and subscribe on Apple or Google Podcasts, Spotify or another podcast platform.